أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وآله الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآله محمد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله and welcome to this session of Mizan Live we have made it to article number 114 alhamdulillah um, before you know it this book is over we reached article number 14 which is about shafa ah. we were talking about um, the uh, what happens the different things that happen on the day of judgment I talked about how out of all the things that do happen on the day of judgment one of them has been isolated in this book of Ayatollah Subhani which is the chapter of um, Shafa ah and intercession uh, there's a reason why he does that and because there are some issues there are some questions in that regard he kind of will allude to and um, he kind of will allude to and um, and discuss a little bit. The thing is that uh, Shafa ah and intercession is just like I've said before with regarding all other topics covered in this book. It is something that <coughs> excuse me, many many volumes of books discussions have been written on and have been have been had. Discussions have been had. Um, but let's see how much he goes in depth here. Um, the, the least is that we'll scratch the surface a little bit and um, we will be able to uh, at least get an idea of what's out there, of questions regarding this idea of shafa, ah, this notion of shafa. Ah. All right, article number 114. He says that shafa ah, intercession, it is for the ones who, well, before I get into it then, I mean, he doesn't even... Um, he doesn't even define shafa, ah, which is interesting. Let me look in the English real quick. He says, intercession. Belief in the intercession of intercessors on the day of resurrection with God's permission is axiomatic in Islam. Widely accepted. So he doesn't, he doesn't even get into the definition. Now, maybe later on he does. I don't remember him getting into it later. Maybe he doesn't because it's a very clear concept for a lot of people. Everyone's heard of it before. Or... Um, if that's not the case, then uh, the verses and hadiths that he brings later will also show us what is meant by this shafa. Ah. Anyway, shafa ah intercession means uh, that on the day of judgment, there will be certain individuals who, as a result of their intercession for others, those others will make it to paradise. They will make it to God's forgiveness and mercy and so on. In other words, if it wasn't for that intercession, they wouldn't make it. Yes. Now, the prophet is an intercessor. We'll get to like some of the details. Angels might be intercessors. De scholars might be intercessors. Righteous individuals might be uh, intercessors. There's a it's a, it's a wide range of uh, people. He says, but this shafa. Ah, this is where the discussion be begins. He says this shafa ah belongs to those people who have not totally disconnected themselves from God and religion. So, if a person, for example, has turned their back on God totally and gone atheist, for example, and they know that it's the truth, yet they turn away from it, uh, this person, according to this, according to what Ayatollah Subhani says, this person will not uh, enjoy shafa ah on the Day of Judgment. Okay, well, if you're talking about a concept in Islam, Something that's going to happen on the Day of Judgment. Ayatollah Subhani, what's your proof for this? He says, I got lots of proof. He says, I have proof from the Qur'an, I have proof from the Hadiths. He says, There are verses in the Qur'an which indicate the reality of the principle of intercession on the Day of Resurrection. And this noble scripture, meaning the Qur'an, elucidates both this principle and its dependence on the permission and good pleasure of God. We have to understand this, brothers and sisters, intercession, if you hear about it, it doesn't mean that there are some people out there who will be able to do God's work without God's permission. No, no, no. He's trying to emphasize here that even if anyone believes in intercession of the Shia, they believe in intercession because God gave permission to some people to intercede. Now, someone might ask, why is it the case that God wants others to intercede? Why doesn't He just take people to Jannah Himself? 
there might be a deeper, more meta, meta mystical, excuse me, explanation to that that we're not going to get into. That why does God want to do it through them instead of doing it himself? Why does he want the Prophet to take certain people to Jannah rather than himself, God himself taking them to Jannah? So he has, we have verses, Surah Anbiya, verse 28. وَلَا يَشْفَعُونَ إِلَّا لِمَنْ ارْتَضَى That on the Day of Judgment, no one can do shafa'a and intercession except for the ones that God is pleased with and is satisfied with them doing shafa'a. Alright, so this itself shows that there is something that, that at the end of the day that is, cons- that is called shafa'a. It just happens through His permission. In another verse, مَا مِنْ شَفِيعٍ إِلَّا مِنْ بَعْدِ إِذْنِهِ Surah Yunus, verse 2, that there is no intercessor except by His permission. If anyone's going to intercede on the Day of Judgment, it is through His permission. Alright, well, who are the intercessors? He says we have other verses that will talk about this before we get into the Hadiths. For example, Surah Najm, verse 26. It says, وَكَمْ مِنْ مَلَكٍ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ لَا تُغْنِي شَفَاعَتُهُمْ شَيْئًا إِلَّا مِنْ بَعْدِ أَنْ يَأْذَنَ اللَّهُ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَرْضَى that how many angels are in the heavens whose intercession is of no avail except after God gives them uh, permission. Yeah, and He gives permission to the ones He wants and the ones that He is happy with and satisfied with that they do intercession for Him. Another verse, Asa an yab'athaka rabbuka maqaman mahmuda. This verse implicitly uh, implies Shafa'a by the Holy Prophet. The reason why I say implicitly because the literal translation of the verse is that God says to the Prophet, It may be that thy Lord will raise thee to a praised station. Allah wants to give you, O Prophet, maqaman mahmuda. He wants to give you a good high rank, a praiseworthy rank. Mahmud comes from hamd, which means to praise. Mahmud means something that is praised. So here, it doesn't say Allah wants to allow you to do shafa'a and intercession, O Prophet, but He wants to give you a high rank that is praiseworthy. Then we have hadiths that explain this verse, that um, or, or mufassirin and, and interpreters and commentators of the Qur'an have told us that what is meant by the maqam Mahmud, that praiseworthy rank, is that um, is the rank of shafa and interceding for others? And th- if you think about it, it is a high rank. Why? Because not only are you going to Jannah, you're so up there that you can take others to Jannah with you. All right. <clears throat> What about shafa'a in hadiths? Do we have hadiths that talk about shafa'a? Of course we do. One, two. He brings two hadiths here and some explanation. The first hadith is by the Holy Prophet ﷺ. He said, My intercession is especially for the perpetrators of major sins in my community. Look at that. So, <clears throat> there are people who have preserved their faith believe in God, they haven't cut off their their ties with the deen and the religion, yet of course they are committing major sins sometimes. This is something that's normal, it happens, unfortunately. No one's perfect, no one's ma'asum. And so people will commit major sins. The Prophet says, my shafa, my intercession is for these people actually. This is so hope-inspiring by the way, that we thought, because there are some people, I mean, growing up, they would tell us, you know, and this usually comes from other schools of thought, certain other schools of thought, not all other schools of thought, but certain other schools of thought, like the Khawarij of the past, the theological school of the Khawarij, holds that um, if you commit major sins, you go, you're, you're do- destined for Jahannam and the hellfire. That's what they say, or that's what they used to say, I don't know if they still say that, <clears throat> You always have that discussion. And as kids growing up, sometimes they would tell us the same thing. People would tell us, if you commit one major sin, that's what makes it major. The fact that it takes you to Jahannam forever. No. 
With a repentance, it is forgiven. With the intercession of a prophet it is, or, or others, it's forgiven. It can be forgiven. But that doesn't take away from it being a major sin. All right, so in this hadith it says, the ones who have done major sins. Question, what about <clears throat> those who've committed minor sins? Do they not need intercession? Well, according to a verse of the Quran, not necessarily. <coughs> Excuse me. Surah Nisa, verse 31, says that if you refrain, O Muslims, O Mu'mineen, in tajtanibu kaba'ira ma tunhawna anhu, nukaffir ankum sayyatikum wa nudkhilkum mudkhalan karima, that, O um, believers, which is talking about the believers, if you stay away from and if refrain from the uh, the major sins of God, if you stay away from the big sins of God that Allah has told you to stay away from, what do we do? We will absolve you of your misdeeds and admit you to a noble abode. So don't worry too much about those minor sins. Yes, a person who is on a spiritual path of wayfaring and is doing sayr and suluk to Allah and trying to traverse the path to Allah's satisfaction, minor sins are even something to stay away from. The hadith, the famous hadith by either the Prophet or Imam Ali, I don't remember right now, holds that don't look at how small the sin is, look at how great the one that is being disobeyed is. So those who are you know, a little higher on that spiritual ladder, They'll say that, you know, I don't care if it's a minor sin, major sin, whatever it is. If it's sin, meaning disobedience of the beloved of God, I'm going to stay away from it anyway. Because the sin, no matter how small or big, doesn't matter. The one who is being disobeyed is big for sure. And so perfect and so lovable for sure. And I don't want that. <coughs> okay, so I'll just read off of what he says here. That the Prophet said, my intercession is especially for the perpetrators of major sins in my community. It would seem that the reason why this should be the case is that God has explicitly promised that if people avoid major sins, they will be forgiven of the minor sins. Surah Nisa, verse 31. Hence, there would be no need for intercession or the like for those who commit minor sins. That's the first hadith he brings here. The second hadith he brings here is says, the Prophet said, I was given five things by Allah. One of those five, أُعْطِيتُ shafa'a. I was given shafa'a, an intercession. فَدَّخَرْتُهَا لِأُمَّتِي فَهِيَ لِمَنْ لَا يُشْرِكُ بِاللَّهِ So I set it aside uh, and preserved it for my ummah, my people. This is a very broad term to use. For my people, that's what I used it for. That's what I set it aside for. Out of your ummah, out of your people, which ones are qualified? He says, Fahiya. So, this shafa is for those who don't ascribe partners to God. In other words, as I said in the beginning, as or, or as Ayatollah Subhani said in the beginning, it is not for those who have cut off completely from God. For example, become mushrik. Other than that though, you, you're qualified if you have the deen. Yes. He says over here, Atila Subhani, after he mentions these two hadiths, he says if you want to know exactly who these shufa'a are, there's other books on this that you can go refer to. So he's keeping it concise. There is one problem though. And it might have come to some of your minds, those of you listening, that, okay, we have this concept of intercession. And luckily, it's for those who commit major sins. Right? So there's nothing to worry about anymore. Let us uh, be a little freer than we thought we could be. And let we're off the hook a little bit. And this might cause some people to fall into sin, this extra hope that God gives through Shafa. He says, for now, for 
For now it must be noted that belief in intercession, like belief in the acceptance by God of repentance, must not become a means of emboldening people to commit sins. Rather it should be seen as a ray of hope, in whose light forgiveness can be sought, so that one who has committed certain sins might be led back to the straight path and not be reduced to despair, like those who feel that the Divine Mercy has passed them by and they can never revert to the path of rectitude. Yes, so it's just there for extra hope, so that that one random person doesn't say, oh my God, it's all over, I am so evil, I'm so bad, I've committed so many sins in my life, let me let go of everything and become even worse and dig a deeper hole for myself. No, that's not what Allah wants from intercession. That's what Allah doesn't want and that's why He's put intercession there. Now Ayatollah Subhani makes a good point here. He says, just like the door of uh, repentance is open and tawbah is open, that same way, that can also be taken advantage of. So if God has put tawbah there, and tawbah is in the Qur'an as well, just like shafa'ah is in the Qur'an, if we figure out tawbah, that okay, yeah, tawbah is there, there's always, a, you know, the door is open for a return always for us, and this does not cause us any issues in, in, our, in our minds that, oh, this, but this is emboldening people to sin. Whatever answer we give with the tawbah, we can also give with shafa'a. Allah is going to try His best. Allah is going to try the be- His best to get us into Jannah. That's what it seems like. But we have to do our part. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, we have to keep this in mind. The Qur'an alludes to this as well. Sometimes, continuing to sin will lead to one's turning away from and rejection of religion and God. ثُمَّ كَانَ عَاقِبَةَ الَّذِينَ أَسَاءُوا السُّوءَ أَنْ كَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِ اللَّهِ Very important verse of the Qur'an that tells us that look, some people out there, they did bad deeds and as a result of their bad deeds they turned away from Allah. This understanding that, okay, there is always shafa'a there for me, or there is always tawbah and repentance there for me, so let me sin as much as I want. Yeah, tawbah and shafa'a are there if you're still in the faith. But if you continue to disobey God, the Qur'an says some people, as a result of their disobedience of God, it's not that they even stayed believers and just disobeyers of God. They disobeyed God, and it reached the point where they just denied God altogether. And we have this problem in this day and age as well. Our kids, man, they are out there, I know. And they, our younger generation is out there. And sometimes they get caught up in too much sin. You see this, that yeah, sometimes this person might not even know themselves why they're denying God now. Yeah, they find excuses to deny God. But when you really dig deep, this person, as a result of their disobedience of Allah, has reached the point where they don't care anymore. They are totally heedless and careless. I'm not saying this is for everybody, but sometimes this can be the case. The Quran says, Then the fate of those who committed misdeeds was that they denied the signs of Allah and they used to deride them, make fun of them. While we said intercession... And tawbah is for those who still are connected to the faith, but they're making mistakes in life. They're committing sins in life. But we have to try to do our part and not let go and just keep continuing with the sin. No, you sinned, fine. Get back up on your feet. Try your best not to fall into that sin again. Try to change the environment that you're in so that you don't fall into that sin anymore, etc., etc. All right, Article 115. is something that you can tell he is discussing because it is a matter that is discussed even till today between the, I could say, maybe the Wahhabi school and the Shi'i school. Or even the Wahhabi school versus other schools, not even always Shia, even other more, maybe if for lack of better terms, a more, more moderate um, schools of of the Sunni denomination, yeah. So, but what's for sure is if you go to Medina or Mecca right now and you say 
out loud to the Holy Prophet, although the Holy Prophet uh, might not be alive. If you ask the Holy Prophet for his shafa'a, O oh Prophet, be my shafi' before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be my intercessor. Some might say that this is, this is problematic. So the question here in article number 115 is, is it okay for us to say, O oh Prophet of God, be my intercessor, intercessor between me and God? Is this okay or not? He says the answer to this is as follows. The legitimacy of such a practice was acknowledged unanimously, Shi, Sunni, everybody, by all Muslims until the 8th century after Hijra, 14th century Gregorian, after which a number of persons opposed the practice, regarding it as impermissible. I think he's referring to Ibn Taymiyyah and uh, his students. This, despite the fact that Quranic verses, prophetic sayings, hadiths, and the established conventional practices of the Muslims all attested to its permissibility. Let me explain this last piece that says uh, established conventional practices. Sometimes one of the proofs to show that something is permissible is Siratul Uqala. Okay, I don't want to get into it too much, but the conventional practices of the Muslims, or Siratul Mutasharra, if we if you want to say it better. Um, and so, what is that? What is that uh, referring to? It refers to what argument comes out of this? If something was a common practice of the Muslims, yes, yet the Prophet and the Imams did not speak against it, did not tell people to stay away from it. It shows that it's not a problem. Yes, sometimes someone does something in their house. It's not a common practice. And the Prophet or Imams doesn't say anything about it because they're not in that house anyway. Yeah, That can't be used as proof that, oh, it's okay because the Prophet would have said something. No, you did it in your house, you know. But sometimes something is a common practice. And the Prophet and Imams are aware of this common practice. And they know that 75% of the people, this is how they do things. That means they have to make 75% of an effort to, re- tell the pe- to tell the people to refrain from it. If something is a common practice and it's wrong, to the amount, to the extent that it is practiced, the Prophet and Imams have to speak against it to let the people know it's not allowed. Yes, here he's saying that uh, the common practice of the people has always been that they say, tell, tell the Prophet, or tell the imams that I want you to be my shafi, my intercessor on the day of judgment, or they do dua stuff like that. That the prophet is their intercessor. If there was anything wrong with this, the prophet, the imams would have said something. It's a common, conventional practice amongst the people. Yet there's nothing by the imams of the prophets. He says that tells us to refrain from such a practice. So that, I'm just trying to explain that last part where he ta- where he said established conventional practices. So he says we have three reasons. Number one. The Qur'an. Number two, hadith of the Prophet. Number three, established conventional practices of the Muslims, which shows this is something they must have learned from the Prophet, or else they wouldn't be doing it unanimously, or the majority of them wouldn't be doing it. <coughs> There's technical language here I'm just staying away from. Sira mutasharra versus Siratul Uqala. Siratul Uqala needs the stamp of approval from the Shari'ah, Siratul Mutasharra'ah doesn't need a stamp of approval because it comes with its stamp of approval because it has to do with the Mutasharra'ah. I don't want to get into that. Just letting some of you who might be listening later who are familiar with this technical language that, uh, yeah, we're aware of that stuff. You know, uh, with pay, taking that into consideration, I'm saying what I'm saying. Okay, so anyway. He goes on to say, for the intercession of the intercessors is, in essence, a prayer on behalf of others, and there is no doubt that asking for the prayers of the pious, and especially the Prophet, is both permissible and laudable. If a person says, O Prophet, be my shafi' on the Day of Judgment, what does that mean? That means that, O Prophet, do dua for me. Ask Allah to forgive me. What's wrong with that? Shouldn't be anything wrong with that. Doesn't seem like there's anything wrong with that. A hadith of the Prophet related by Ibn Abbas makes it clear that the intercession of a believer consists in the making of a petition on behalf of others. What does the hadith say? It says, 
If a Muslim dies and 40 believers in the unity of God pray for him, God accepts their intercession on his behalf. He says, look at this hadith. It says that 40 people attest to you, or do, do, excuse me, do dua over your janazah, your dead body. Yeah, they pray over your body. Allah accepts their intercession. He says, look, see, here in this hadith, intercession is used, but for what? For prayer that they're doing. This shows that when you're telling the Prophet, be my shafi', that means, hey, O Prophet, I want you to pray for me, I want you to do dua for me, I want you to ask for forgiveness for me by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Question someone might ask, why would I want the Prophet to ask God for forgiveness for me? Why don't I do it myself? Answer, because the Prophet is more beloved to Allah than me. Yes, and Allah wants us to acknowledge that as well. So, just like, you know, when there's... Um, when we have friends that I want something from my friend, I know my friend likes somebody else more than he likes me. right? I want something from my friend. I go tell that person that is more beloved, hey, can you ask him to like give me a piece of his cake, give me a piece of his pizza, instead of me asking directly. right? I don't know. You can think of better examples. That's not a very good example. But anyway, you get my point. So the reason why we even ask them to go to Allah's door is because Allah has more respect for them over us. There's a better chance of their dua getting accepted. This doesn't mean that we're not going to do dua, of course, and we're not going to ask for forgiveness either because there is benefit in that for us directly as well. But we are also going to ask them for that help. There's nothing wrong with that. He says, a glance at the pages of history reveals that the co companions of the Prophet asked him in their own lifetimes. For his intercession, Tirmidhi relates from Anas bin Malik, I asked the Prophet to intercede for me on the Day of Judgment. He said, I shall do so. I asked him, where will I find you? He replied, by the side of the Sirat, the path that we talked about, that bridge that goes over Jahannam, uh, that we talked about maybe last session. So he says the reality of seeking intercession then is nothing other than the request for prayers from the intercessor. He wants to give us now at least three, yes, three examples of verses in the Quran that people have asked prophets or righteous individuals to do shafa'ah for them and to ask God for forgiveness for them. So he says, for example, the sons of Yaqub, Jacob, after the disclosure of their wicked acts. So they confessed eventually because they had no choice. They had been exposed. The brothers of Yusuf السلام, had been exposed and their father knew that they, had, they were the ones who had thrown Yusuf into the well. So what happens is they said to their father, Ya Aba, Ya Aba tistaghfir lana. Oh, oh Father, do istighfar for us. Let me pull it up real quick. Surah Yusuf, verse 98. Qala astaghfiru lakum rabbi. The, pre the previous verse. Qalu ya abana. Yeah, not la, ya abati, excuse me. Ya abana astaghfir lana dhunubana inna kunna khati'een. Oh Father, Ask for forgiveness uh, for our sins. Verily, we are of those who were mistaken. We were we, we did wrong, and so he said, "Yes, I shall do istighfar for you for you and ask for forgiveness for you from my Lord, because He is all merciful, all forgiving." So this shows that they asked, and the and the, the Quran is relating this story. There's nothing wrong with it. Then, second story he brings, or second verse he brings. It says, and if, when they had wronged themselves, the Qur'an is talking about those who have done wrong, who've sinned during the Prophet's time. And if, when they had wronged themselves, they had but come unto thee, come to you, O Prophet, and ask forgiveness of God, and the Messenger had sought forgiveness for them, they would have found God forgiving, merciful. They should have come to you, O Prophet, asked you to do istighfar for them, asked you to ask Allah for forgiveness for, for them. they would If they had done that, they would have found Allah to be all-forgiving, all-merciful. 
the Quran is telling them that they should be doing this actually. So Ayatul Subhani is making this point of how uh, there's nothing wrong with asking the Prophet to be a Shafi, to be a person who intercedes, to be the middle person between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third verse is a verse regarding the munafiqeen, the, the hypocrites. And when it is said unto them, Come, the messenger of God will ask forgiveness for you. What do these munafiqeen do? They avert their faces, and thou see that seest them turning away disdainful. That's what you see. You see them turning away disdainful. Surah Munafiqoon. Surah Munafiqoon, verse number 5. So that's their trait, that they turn away. But that's not the point here. The point is that this is what's being said to them. By who? By the Prophet, by anyone else. And the Qur'an is relating this and saying this is how it's supposed to be. That when you tell them munafiqeen, and is scolding them for not doing this, when you tell these hypocrites, munafiqeen, that come to the Prophet, let him ask for forgiveness for you, they turn away. Yes? So it shows that, okay, then for sure this is something that is encouraged. And that's why it's scolding them for not making the most of that and, and taking advantage of that opportunity. Now here, this question that we just addressed of is it okay to ask the Prophet to be Shafi'i? And we brought verses. First we define Shafi'i, how it's just kind of like a prayer. You know, We're asking that the Prophet uh, prays to God for us, ask God for forgiveness for us, ask God to elevate our ranks for us, First we defined it, then we said that this has happened in the Qur'an, yes? So we've had in the Prophet Yaqub story, we have it in the, the, the story of the Munafiqeen, and we have it regarding the other wrongdoers. We have examples of that in the Qur'an. So now someone will say, so see, it's okay to ask the Prophet to be a Shafi'i. Get out of my face, but... Someone might come right back and say, who said I don't believe in Shafa'a on the Day of Judgment? Or who says I don't believe in asking the Prophet <coughs> when he's alive, telling him, O Prophet of God, be my Shafi'a. I don't have a problem with that, this person says. The problem I have, and this is the part where it's really now turns really um, something between the Ibn Taymiyyah school of thought versus other schools of thought. This person says, no, no, the problem isn't asking the Prophet to be Shafi'i when he's alive. The problem is when he has died and is no longer alive in this world. That's where we have a problem. Asking him when he's dead is a problem, to be our Shafi'i. Ayatullah Subhani answers this. He says, Now, the fact that the intercessor in the verses quoted is no longer alive does not detract from the argument propounded. Right? Even if it is supposed, supposed, or supposed, even if it be supposed that these verses pertain to the living prophet and not the dead prophet, this still does not diminish the validity of the principle. Why? Because if seeking intercession from the living is not shirk and polytheism, so it shows this, this is the problem. Asking a dead person is shirk. That's what is being said in the face of the Shia school and other schools that also believe in Shafa. They tell you, no, 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 it's shirk, it's polytheism. You're supposed to only ask God. Ayatollah Subhani, he says, look, when they're alive, if asking them is okay and it is not shirk, then them being dead is also not shirk. Because at the same time, we all believe that no one dies and is nothing. Their soul is still there. So we're asking them, their soul, to do such for us. What makes something shirk or not shirk is not life or death of that person. Ayatollah Subhani is trying to push forward. What, it, what makes something shirk or not shirk is the fact that do I see this person as the only reason for my forgiveness? As if the Prophet has to forgive me, not God. No, this is just a means to God, he said. So if I'm looking at them 
as a means, they're, then if they're alive or dead, it shouldn't make a difference, he says. You see, he says, because if seeking intercession from the living is not shirk, then naturally seeking intercession from the dead will not be so either. The question of whether the intercessor is alive or dead is immaterial or is irrelevant as regards the distinction between Tawheed and Shirk. Being alive or dead has nothing to do with something being Shirk or not, he says. I'll give you an example, brothers and sisters. If I, if I am worshipping an idol, that's Shirk. An idol is dead, it not, doesn't have life. Does that mean if I now worship someone who's alive, it's not shirk anymore? No, it's still shirk. Because worshipping is only reserved for God. It doesn't matter if the object is live or not alive. If asking a live person for shafa is not shirk, then asking a, a person who's passed away but his soul only hears me now, still shouldn't be shirk. That's what Ayatollah Subhani is saying here. And I think it's a very valid argument, a very, very valid argument. The only question is whether when these blessed souls re receive requests for interce intercession, they can hear them or not. He says that's the question we need to address. This is a question that relates to the reality and the benefit of the connection between the two groups. The petitioners and those petitioned. And it will be addressed below in the debate on tawassul. Below meaning in future articles. So he says, look, the problem with this shafa thing right now that we're talking about really shouldn't be even addressed here. It should be addressed somewhere else that we're going to talk about, and that's in the chapter of Tawassul. And that is where it gets very uh, heated, of course, because that is something that's heavily contested uh, when it comes to the uh, Wahhabi school of thought uh, versus other schools of thought who believe in Tawassul, meaning seeking a means to God through those other than God who are righteous individuals. Someone might say here that, uh, look, I don't see any difference between asking for intercession, shafa, that we're doing for with the Prophet, for example, and the idol worshippers of the past. They were also just doing istishfa and asking for shafa from the idols. Really? Yes. I'll, I'll share a verse with you, and I've said this before as well that it's not that uh, in the past and during the times of Jahiliya pre-Islam, people who worshipped idols, they worshipped them as if they're the creators of the heavens and earth. No, they believed in God. The Qur'an explicitly says this, that if you ask them who created the heavens and earth, they say Allah created the heavens and earth. Yeah? The thing is then, why, why are they worshipping these handmade idols? The answer that they would give you is Surah Zumar, verse number three. It says, "Ma na'buduhum illa liyuqarribuna ila Allahi zulfa." That we only worship them because they get us closer to Allah. They are the middle person between us and God, aka intercession. Someone might say, "Okay." If what the idol worshippers were doing was bad, and in reality it was just them seeking intercession, then what's the difference between what we're doing when we're asking the Prophet to be our intercessor, and what they were doing when they say that uh, we only worship them because they uh, are the ones between us and God. And it says here, and those, I'm just reading the translation of this verse, and those who take guardians besides him, besides Allah, and saying, we only worship them so that they may bring us near to Allah, Allah will indeed judge them between them concerning that about which they differ. About, which they, about what they differ. So, if that's bad, this should be that bad too. Go straight to God. Why are you going through somebody else? They went through idols, you're going through the Holy Prophet. I tried my best, brothers and sisters, to make this question and this challenge sound very logical. Okay? But, let's look at the answer that he gives here now. He says, Here it should be noted 
that seeking the intercession of the prophets and the awliya, those righteous individuals, by true monotheistic believers differs fundamentally from the requests by the polytheistic idolaters for the intercession of their idols. Why? For the monotheists make their request for intercession from the awliya, from these righteous individuals, while acknowledging two principles that the idol worshippers would not acknowledge. What are those? Number one, the station of intercession is the preserve of God and is determined according to His disposition, His discretion. This is very important. That you have this explicitly again in verses of the Qur'an, that yes, they would say, you know, we, we worship them because they get us close to God and all of that. Allah's answer to them is, did I tell you that you should go through these handmade idols of stone and wood to get to me? Shafa, intercession belongs to me, God, <clears throat> right? If it belongs solely to me and God only, I can tell you where you can uh, uh, practice it. Or else, if you do it without my permission and you think you're getting close to me, think again. You're wasting your time. As a matter of fact, you're getting yourself ready for the hellfire. These idols, I didn't ask you to go through them to me. So these people who do istishfa or ask for shafa through the righteous individuals, the prophets, they're doing so because they have proof that God has okayed that, allowed that, encouraged that. That's number one, he says. It's a very good point. Very, very, very valid point in my opinion. Shafa belongs only to God and he can tell you where you can exercise it. He doesn't want it happening through some wood or brick or stone idol, number one. So just the fact that these people still believed in God, but thought that they can get intercession through these idols, is not going to be good enough for them. You know, some people they say that, yeah, oh good, cool, they were actually worshipping God, they really believed in Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Yes, the Quran even says that. That if you ask them who created the heavens and the earth, they will say, Allah did. They're not going to say this wooden uh, idol did because the guy made the idol three days ago or bought it off of Amazon or something. I don't know. And so they knew that this, this little creature of theirs that they created, this creation of theirs that they created isn't the creator of the heavens and the universe uh, or heavens and earth. It's God. It's Allah. But that's not enough. You have to have permission from that God. You can't just say, you know what? From this day forward, I will seek closeness to God through this door. Well, God does not. God, did God tell you that you can get close to Him through that door? It's like saying this is a dumb example, but I'm going to say it. It's like saying I'm trying to win a girl's heart over or a guy's heart over by giving them daisies when they when they like tulips, or when I don't even know if they liked daisies. Yeah. For all I know, that person might be allergic to daisies. Might dislike daisies. First, I got to make sure that this person uh, likes daisies. Then I buy them a, a, hand, a, a set of daisies. Or else, I'm not going to waste my time. Or even worse, get something that they're allergic to and is going to make them even more angry of me and disliking of me. You get what I'm saying, brothers and sisters? I hope that's a reasonable example. Anyway, that's the first thing. He says, these people, the monotheists who practice intercession... When they do it, they're relying on certain principles that others, the idol worshippers, were not. Principle number one, permission from God. Knowing that God wants us to go through this individual, or that thing, or that person, or whatever it is. Number two principle. It says, The intercessors to whom the monotheist believer extends his hands, seeking their prayers, are purified servants of God, blessed by their proximity to Him, and thus those whose prayers are accepted. Common sense. Who does God like more? The Holy Prophet or me? Of course the Holy Prophet. So I'm going to ask the Holy Prophet. You all have heard the dua of Tawassul, dua Tawassul? Yes? It doesn't take more than 10 minutes. Where you ask the Holy Prophet all the way to the 12th Imam, 
Ya vajihan indallah, ishfa' lana indallah, be my shafi'. I can't find anyone higher than you people to be the, the intercessors between me and God. Yes? So he says, they're going to righteous individuals. But what were the idol worshippers going to? A piece of stone that they created. A, a wooden block that they chipped away from and they made a, an idol from. Why? Who? I mean, what, doesn't make sense. This, is, this thing doesn't even live. It's not even alive. Intercession is an action. Yes, it is actively done. For that you need intelligence. An idol doesn't have intelligence. So these are the two principles, he says, that monotheists are relying on when they practice intercession or when they ask for intercession. Well, the idol worshippers didn't have that. So that's what sets them apart from each other. And I think, personally, that that, that is a very good explanation. Uh, these are very important points here. So there is a big difference between the two. And then so he wants to conclude here, and I'm going to also conclude our, our session tonight with this part point. And um, we'll leave it at that. He says, taking due note of these two principles, the difference between the monotheists seeking intercession and the polytheistic idolaters alive at the time of the Prophet becomes readily apparent. Firstly, the polytheists believed in setting no kind of limits or con con conditional conditionality on the making of their requests for intercession. Unrestricted. I can do intercession, I can ask for intercession through whatever I want, no limits or conditions. The monotheists, on the other hand, following the guidance of the Holy Quran, know that the station of intercession is the exclusive preserve of God, and the success of the intercession of other intercessors is totally contingent about his, upon his permission and good pleasure. So think about it, brothers and sisters. You're not actually taking this individual up high. They are high anyway, the Holy Prophet, for example. But what I want, the point I want to make is this. When you ask for intercession, it's not just you giving importance to the intercessor. You are also giving importance to the Lord Himself. Why? Because the, you are following His command, even when it comes to intercession. And you're going to the ones He wants for intercession. That itself is obedience of God. That itself is giving importance and significance to God and God's station. So that's one. Secondly, the polytheists alive at the time of the Prophet believed that their idols, through, though fashioned by their own hands and created by their own hands, were gods and lords, imagining, imagining in their deluded folly that these, that these lifeless objects had been endowed with a share in divinity. This is a major difference between the polytheists and the monotheists. If they were going to the idols, yes, they believed that God is the creator of the heavens and the earth, but some of them, if not all of them, also believe that now God has delegated divinity to them and they're divine beings now. While in the correct version of intercession, there is no such thing. I go to the Prophet, but I don't give him 1% divinity. All divinity belongs to the divine, which is God. He, in, in turn, has given some permission to the Holy Prophet to intercede for me. And I go to him with that mentality. So it says that they were delusional. They thought that these lifeless objects had been endowed with a share in divinity and lordship. The monotheists, on the contrary, considered the prophets and the imams as servants of God and continuously chant phrases such as his slave and his prophet. And the righteous slaves of God. Righteous servants of God. The vast distance that separates these two divergent attitudes towards intercession could hardly be clearer. And he's right. It is this obvious, the difference between the two. Therefore, the attempt to prove the, the illegit illegitimacy of the principle of intercession in Islam by reference to verses that invalidate the seeking of intercession by the idolaters from their idols is nothing but an utterly misplaced analogy, a piece of baseless sophistry. So he's trying to say here that because some people have used verses of the Qur'an that say, why do you go to the idols for help? Go to Allah. They've used these verses to say, the Shia and the other schools of thought that also might practice this istishfa and asking for shafa'a, 
that they use those verses of the, that speak against the idolaters to disprove what these Muslims are also doing when they ask the Prophet for intercession. He says, no, there is a flawed argument. There is a big difference between what the idolaters would practice and what the Muslims practice when they ask the Prophet for intercession. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Next week we have, he wants to talk about uh, tawbah and uh, asking for forgiveness and repentance, inshallah. Um, we'll leave it till next week. Yes, we have one more session next week and then we'll have a week off after that, inshallah. So till next week, keep us in your du'as. Wassalamu alaikum wa